coming up on UGTV. A special session of the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's a little bit after five. I appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, I would ask the clerk to please announce the meeting and call the roll. A special session has been held on Thursday, December 10th, 2015 at 5 o'clock p.m. regarding a discussion with the Wyandotte County delegates. Roll call. Johnson? Here. Kane? Here. Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbrook? Here. Bynum? Here. Walker? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Mugia? Here. Holland? Here. Thank you very much. This is a special session um, that I, I intend to do every year. Uh, last year was our first year, um, but very successful. Every year, the unified government publishes our legislative agenda for the State House. And it's clear that in order to do that, we need to get feedback from the folks who represent Wyandotte County in Topeka. And so last year we started this, we had a dinner earlier, and now we have an opportunity to look at our legislative agenda, to talk it through uh, as commissioners and as representatives and senators, and um, talk about how we can best approach some of the challenging issues we face at the state. But what I'd like to do to facilitate that is I'm just gonna ask us, uh, we called roll for the commissioners, but I think it would be helpful if we just went around the table and had each person rep uh, introduce yourself um, and your role um, so that the folks um, watching will be able to see, um, see who you are. So um, we'll start over here with this uh, distinguished commissioner. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> Good evening, Gail Townsend, happy to represent uh, District 1, Unified Government. Jim Walters, uh, Commissioner for District 7. Can we forget <clears throat> this oh, um, Good evening, happy to be here tonight. My name is Kathy Wolf Moore, and I'm the legislator from the 36th District, which is Western Wyandotte County. Thank you very much. I'm Melissa Bynum, Unified Government Commissioner, District 1 at large. I'm Representative Louis Ruiz, representing the 31st District and also the Assistant Minority Leader of the Kansas House. Angelo Markley, Unified Government District 6, which includes Turner and Argentine. Representative Tom Burroughs, Democratic Leader, 33rd District, which includes Bonner Springs, Edwardsville, and the southern part of KCK. Doug Bach, I'm the County Administrator for the Unified Government. 
Uh, Mark Holland, the mayor for the unified government. I'm Senator Pat Petty, and I represent the 6th District, and it goes all the way from Slurbaum to 7th and Central, and then all the South Side, and all the way on then um, out by Providence, and I don't cross state until um, I think it's a, a 90, 90th. <laughs> so, and I have, um, so I have all the South Side. And um, Argentine, Armadale, Rosedale, Turner, a little bit of Edwardsville, and then a small portion of Johnson County as well. Hello, I'm Unified Government uh, Commissioner for District 8, and Representative Stan Fraunfelter is not here yet. He's running a little late, and he is my representative, so I count him as he better be here soon. Al Walker, Unified uh, Government uh, <coughs> District 2 at Large Commissioner. Uh, Steve Fitzgerald, Kansas Senate District 5, uh, essentially west of 435. Ann Mergia, I'm District 3 Commissioner, and that includes half of Argentine and all of Rosedale. Harold Johnson, District 4 Commissioner, Unified Government. All right, thank you. I appreciate everyone being here. Um, appreciate all the work that the Wyandot legislators do on our behalf um, in Topeka. Um, it's a very uh, difficult environment um, right now. The unified government has been hurt badly by many of the policies in Topeka, um, as have our school districts. And we appreciate um, our delegation um, working for us and for our, our citizens um, to counter some of these negative proposals. So we're going to, I also might note that we have both the minority leader and the assistant minority leader are on our delegation. And so um, clearly folks across Kansas, when looking for a moderate voice, are looking to Wyandotte County for leadership. And so we very much appreciate um, uh, Burroughs, your, your work, and Reese, your work as well. As well. Reese, we're um, very blessed to have the two of you um, in leadership positions in um, the House and working on our behalf. So we appreciate that. What I do want to um, ask now is ask uh, Mike Taylor, um, who is our um, representative who goes to Topeka on our behalf. He um, lobbies on behalf of the unified government and has a great perspective, has years of experience, and has does the initial draft of our legislative agenda. What we're going to do tonight is he's going to present the highlights of that, and then I believe next week we will adopt it as our own. But we didn't want to adopt it until we got feedback from our representatives. Um, tonight. So that's the point of tonight's meeting is to walk through our legislative agenda and go from there. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, good to see all of you legislators. Probably by April you'll be tired of seeing me, so I'll, I'll say hi when we're in a more cordial environment here. It gets to be a long session. I think it will be a difficult session. The state's facing uh, continued financial issues, which tend to trickle down to local government and have, and we'll talk some about that. Um, is that is that mic on? Uh, is it? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, I just need to get it closer. Okay. I get You get the good mics. I've got the kind of the old one. So, okay, I'll speak more closely into it. So what I'm going to do is go through our priority issues for the session and then talk about some of the, the new issues that have cropped up since last year. A lot of our legislative program, which you have copies of, and... I have copies for the public, and it'll be posted on the website for everyone to see. A lot of those are the same sort of basic platform issues from year to year, so I'm not going to take our time to talk about those, but talk about some of the new issues. Um, the number one issue... Tim? Apparently not. second. Okay, so the, the number one issue uh, for us this year is calling for repeal of the property tax lid that was approved very late in the session in 2015. Our view is it's unworkable because of the election schedules that's required. It's unnecessary because despite what some of the supporters of this would say, local governments have not run wild with raising property taxes. 
and we believe it violates the spirit of small government, local control, and the Home Rule Amendment of the Kansas Constitution. Our view is that um, local elected officials, you the commission, were elected to decide what our budget should be, what the level of services should be, and how that should be paid for. And uh, we don't necessarily need Topeka, a sort of big brother government telling us how to do that. So we're going to be working very hard uh, for repeal of that. And the League of Kansas Municipalities, the Association of Counties, uh, the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, the KCK Chamber of Commerce all support that position. So it'll be, it'll be an interesting um, discussion and fight. I know that there's a bill being pre-filed uh, by a senator that, that would call for repeal. And so we're going to be supporting that. Um, are, is it your intention to talk about each one as you go? How many total are you going to highlight? There, there are several. And I'm, I'm going to uh, go here to the next. What I was thinking we could do is I could kind of run through these. And if you would note questions or comments, and maybe we can kind of do it then so we can flow through. Because some of these may not bring up that much discussion. Absolutely. OK. Um, a number two priority, and this is a broad-based platform, but I feel a need for it because in the past several years, the relationship between the legislature and local governments has deteriorated significantly. So what we w would ask for is renewing a partnership and cooperative spirit between the state government and local levels of government um, and to address the issue of increasing property taxes, which is caused in large part by shifting costs from state government to local governments. Um, and we're asking that the legislature not continue solving its budget shortfalls by taking revenues that belong to or are legally obligated to city and county governments. Give you a quick little sidetrack here and show you what some of that's done to us. Elimination of the mortgage registration fee two years ago, that was pushed by the bankers and the realtors. It was approved. Uh, it is now costing the unified government an estimated $2 million a year in lost revenue. An interesting note, the mortgage registration fee had been a fairly stable uh, fund for local government since the year 1925. And it was pushed through and approved and, and taken away from us, so it's costing us $2 million a year. The repeal of the machinery and equipment tax in 2006, since that happened, the unified government is now losing $11.3 million a year in actual dollars. Our assessed value for the county, because we're so heavily industrial, has declined by $137 million. Um, the decision to eliminate that tax on machinery and equipment was very positive for business, and I will admit it's helped us attract some, some industry to Wyandotte County. The problem is it's not, uh, <coughs> those revenues have not been replaced in terms of, of our treasury. Reduction of the delinquent tax uh, interest rate. That was part of a sweeping overhaul of property tax appraisal system two years ago. Uh, didn't get a whole lot of discussion, but it reduced the penalty for people who are deadbeats and don't pay their taxes by 2%. Um, that's costing the UG somewhere around $300,000 to $500,000 a year in, in lost revenues from people that have not paid their taxes. And we believe, as a number of other cities do, that it encourages the non-payment of property taxes in the future. It's cheaper to not pay your taxes than it is to go to the bank and get a loan. Suspension of the ad valorem tax reduction fund. I know this one we keep talking about, and, and it went away in 2003. It had been around since the, the, er, the late 30s, but in 19, the late 1970s, city governments agreed in, in a contract with the state to give up a lot of local taxing authority. Um, we had the ability until that time to impose a local gasoline tax, local cigarette taxes, and other excise taxes. In order to streamline the sales tax system, cities agreed to give up that authority in exchange for the state doing that and then sharing back that revenue with us. The state, in 03, broke that contract, and they stopped sending that money. Uh, the unified government, being a city and county, was collecting, depending on the given year, around $3 million to $4 million a year. So the accumulative effect of that since 2003 has been about $40 million in lost revenue that, that had been, again, dependable revenue. Uh, suspension of the city-county revenue sharing program happened at the same time. Uh, the last payment we got, we were receiving $1.6 million a year in those dollars. Um, so statewide, local governments, city and county governments, since since 03 and because of the, these changes, 
have lost more than two billion dollars in revenue that we used to receive and that is still statutorily legally on the books in the state of Kansas and should be paid it's just that the legislature has chosen not to not to appropriate that money year by year so what's that add up to our total annual revenue loss is 18.2 million dollars that's direct dollars that were coming to the unified government that are now not because of actions by the Kansas legislature so our platform to work in a more partnership cooperative way with the legislature is really driven by this number um, and to try to figure out a way that that they the legislature because of their budget issues don't take our money and then we're forced to maybe raise property taxes which we get blamed for as well <clears throat> one of our big issues and it's one I wish representative Fraunfelter were here right now because this is an issue that he brought to the forefront a few years ago and we've worked diligently on um, we got it past the Senate committee last year and it's sitting on the on the Senate calendar we've worked closely with the city of Topeka the city of Wichita and interestingly, as we, we explored this issue more, we found that cities of a thousand population have the same problem we do. Maybe not to quite the scale, but it's a problem statewide <clears throat> with houses that are abandoned. People have walked away from them, they're now boarded up, they're not usable. We talked to some smaller cities that say, we've got a housing shortage. One city, <clears throat> of less than a thousand residents had 38 abandoned houses in their town and they said we're dying for for housing for people to live in so this is meant to help expedite the process and streamline the process of how we can deal with that growing blight of abandoned nuisance and and foreclosed housing um, it's got very strong support and we're tweaking the bill again this year with some changes that we think may actually get it passed this year Kind of in the same fold, two years ago, Governor Brownback proposed urban opportunity zones. Very, sort of modeled after the rural opportunity zone legislation that he proposed in his first term. Um, it would allow incentives to help get attract businesses or help existing businesses in, in urban areas. Um, again, working with a coalition of, of Wichita, Topeka, KCK, and economic development folks, we're crafting a, a bill that we're hoping we'll get commerce the Department of Commerce to sign off on and get pre-filed before the session starts that will offer a number of tools from TIF to uh, um, other kinds of tools that might help us attract small businesses into urban areas and I'll give it a local example of something we did locally with a uh, small business gap fund that uh, County Minister Doug Bach recommended to help fill those gaps we brought two new businesses into into urban areas of KCK one just a block over it's a the Kansas City cupcake company is moving into a, a building just south of city or just south of City Hall and uh, I'm sorry east of City Hall and a landscape company is coming into Minnesota Avenue and we were able to use some local funds not a lot of money ten thousand dollars just to help close a gap there that attracted those businesses into into our inner city we want to use those sorts of tools on a broader statewide level to help attract businesses. And as I said, the governor um, is supportive of this. And so we, we've been talking all summer about what kind of tools do we need in this bill. And, and that bill hopefully will be introduced before the session starts. City elections, as you know, those were uh, moved from the spring of odd number of years to the fall. There was a strong push at one point to make them partisan and tie them with the presidential, gubernatorial, congressional elections. We were, we were able to, through compromises, stop that. Uh, but I think that is the end game, ultimately, by some folks. And I think, so we're going to continue to watch that. Our, our position is that city elections should remain nonpartisan and be separate from state and national elections. Um, the whole goal of that, as promoted by the people that supported it, was to increase voter turnout. And, and admittedly, the voter turnout in municipal elections is, is not very good. Sometimes it's in the single digits, you know, 4%, 9%. Uh, the last election we had a municipal election, we had over 20% turnout in Wyandotte County in KCK. So we uh, kind of bucked that trend some. But that's still a very low turnout. So we're hoping that this will, will help increase turnout. But we want to be watchful that, that the move to make them partisan and move them to those other years doesn't happen. 
Uh, law enforcement mutual aid. This is a bill that we introduced last year. We got it through um, the House Fed and State Affairs Committee. It's on the calendar in the House. It's supported by uh, all of the law enforcement agencies in the metropolitan area. The Leavenworth County Sheriff, the Wyandotte County Sheriff, the Miami County Sheriff. There's only one uh, sheriff who opposes it, and that's Sheriff Denning of Johnson County. Uh, all the police chiefs support it. And Missouri has already passed this law, but it can't really work until Kansas passes it. And I'll give you an example. What it would do is allow, law in a critical incident, it would allow uh, law enforcement folks from either side of the state line to cross state lines and be able to, to respond. And sort of the poster child example of this, if you remember a few years ago when there was an active shooter at the Ward Parkway Mall, the first police officers to respond to that were from the city of Leewood. They had no authority to do anything. They had to wait for Missouri police officers to show up before they could do anything. Meanwhile, the shooter continued shooting. This would allow it would have allowed those Leewood police officers to actually take action and maybe take out that active shooter. Now they don't have the authority to do it. So that's what this legislation does. We're hoping we can get it passed this year. Medicaid expansion. Uh, the unified government supports the expansion of Medicaid. Um, the refusal of the state to expand Medicaid puts more of a burden on local government and our health department. In Wyandotte County, our public health department is, for many of our citizens, frontline medical care from prenatal clinic to other kinds of services that we offer, um, bringing that money in would help ensure, help people get insurance who now don't have it. Um, KU Hospital last year wrote off close to $40 million in uncompensated care. It would help address that issue. I'm sure Providence is in a similar situation. Um, so we believe that, that it would be beneficial to the state, and we think that we can craft a Kansas solution, as it's been called. A number of Republican states, Arkansas, Indiana, and others, have approached the federal government, and rather than just taking what the federal government has said you have to do, they've crafted their own specific programs for their state. And we are encouraged that we think maybe we can make this happen. The, the, the call for this is growing. And I think it'll be another discussion this year. So Wyandotte County is on that long list of people that export, uh, support Medicaid expansion. Legislative advocacy. This, quite honestly, shouldn't even have to be on a legislative agenda. But there have been some pretty strong efforts by some legislators to prohibit uh, taxpayer-funded lobbyists. That would be my job. Um, they don't believe that cities and counties should be able to have lobbyists in the state house advocating for their local communities. And we think that's just totally wrong. And so we are putting in our platform that we think that all of you think I should have the right to go over there and represent our community on important issues. Uh, protecting home rule and local control. Again, I put this on the priority agenda because of the, the deterioration we've seen in that kind of cooperation. But we support the ability of local elected officials to make decisions for their communities particularly local tax and revenue decisions, as is called for by the Home Rule Amendment of the Kansas Constitution that was approved by voters in 1960. Um, that Home Rule Amendment has been challenged <coughs> on a number of times with, with mandates coming down from the state. Um, we urge the legislature to respect the philosophy of local control and honor the Home Rule Amendment. Um, there's many legislators in Topeka who, who rail against the federal government putting any kind of a, of a mandate on them, whether it's EPA rules or Medicaid or gun laws or prairie chickens, the state resists that. But yet they turn around and repeatedly intrude on local control and meddle in the business of local communities. It's unfortunate, but that's kind of where we've come. So this is on our priority agenda. Some other new issues that are not priorities but are very important, and I'm pointing these out. Um, changes to the CAPER system should not reduce benefits promised to public employees, nor impact the ability of a city county to hire and retain a qualified public employee workforce. There was a bill introduced last year that would have taken away, it would have, it would have capped the, the amount of vacation that local governments can offer their workers. It would have restricted benefits that have been promised for decades to employees. We had over 100 unified government employees who were ready to walk out the door July 1st had that bill passed. 
very detrimental to our workforce, very detrimental to, to that institutional knowledge and experience. We just think that whatever the legislature needs to do with the CAPERS retirement system, they should not infringe on, on promises that were made, in some cases decades ago, to workers who have spent their whole career here. Juvenile justice. Um, there is pending legislation that, that's fairly sweeping in its reforms of the way our system deals with juvenile offenders, and we think many of those changes could well be good, but we're, we're very cautious about the financial responsibility and burden for those changes not being passed down to local units of government. I've invited Phil Lockman, who is our Director of Community Corrections, to join me for just a couple of minutes to talk a little more in detail about that because he knows far more about it than I do. Uh, good evening. Uh, just, just in brief, um, I want to say that uh, this hasn't been turned into legislative uh, uh, documents yet by the reviser of the statutes, but it's very large and sweeping changes to the criminal justice system and how we deal with juveniles in our communities. Uh, the prime mover is that it's going to completely eliminate the use of group homes for children placed out of the home, which in effect will mean that we'll have about 100 to 125 of these youth back in the community. Uh, immediately that saves the state of Kansas about 32 to $35 million a year. Uh, my main point is, is that I, I philosophically agree with almost every point and every change that they're promoting because best practices and common sense will tell you, uh, as well as the research, that these group homes are not effective and that sometimes we make kids worse and that those kids could be better, better handled in the community. Uh, the question is, will those funds stay with those youth when they return to our community so that we can effectively manage them in the community? Uh, not only for improving their outcomes, but keeping our community safe and uh, uh, working with these families. These, these 100 to 120 families are some of the, the, the most high need families that you could imagine. And that's not just in Wyandotte County, that's across the state of Kansas. And so that's probably, if I was to say anything, that's the main thing, is that the funding follows, but that we take a, a very careful look at the approach that we take to implement these changes, because I think uh, the Pew Foundation has done a great deal of work on these, and they are good recommendations, but a great deal of thought needs to be given to the implementation and the timing of these events so that local communities, with some of that money, if not all of the money, transferring from the state, down to, to the local governments or through contractual agreements can put in place the mechanisms through mental health and the social service agency so that we can effectively manage those cases and those kids for better outcomes. Thank you. I think before we move on, there's one last issue that we'll talk about, but I think it might be uh, good to pause at this point before we move on to that issue because I think it'll take a, a significant amount of discussion to see if there are any questions or comments on any of the other issues that we've talked about. Can you back up to the first slide? Maybe we'll just go through your slides again and sure. make sure we comment on them and then move through. So let's start with the tax lid. Um, I think you're absolutely right that the state that rails against the federal government for putting limitations on it is doing the same thing to the local governments. The mythology, of course, is that the counties are spending too much. I just want to point out that a one mill in Wyandotte County is valued at $1 million. One mill in Johnson County is valued at $8 million. We actually spend half in Wyandotte County what Johnson County does per capita on our citizens on our county side of our budget. We're very frugal. Uh, we have to be. Um, because of the valuation that we have in our community, we have to be very frugal, um, very efficient, and very frugal. Um, and this rhetoric that comes out that somehow counties and cities are spending these out outlandish amounts of money um, is simply a fallacy. And we need to combat that fallacy and we need to push back um, and suggest that um, there already has been a public vote about how to set the mill levy and the commissioners were voted to do that. And um, if we break faith with the community, then the community will vote for someone else to be in here. And we're all very aware of that. So I think this tax lit issue is a high priority to get taken off um, because it impedes um, our ability to, to run this government. The other thing it does, we have a star bond payoff coming back, $12 million in 2017. One of the hopes for that has always been to reduce our property taxes. The state has just disincentivized us from lowering our property taxes 
because as soon as we lower it, we can never raise it again. And so the idea that we have an opportunity, a real opportunity to lower our property taxes, and we can't. The other piece, it's anti-growth. Say uh, when the healthy campus comes to pass in downtown Kansas City, Kansas, and it raises the property values of the properties around it, we can't capture that value increase um, to provide the basic services for the new people living there. Um, it disincentivizes communities from investing because we can't, if we can't capture the growth of value, which is exactly what we should be doing, the state needs Wyandotte County to continue to grow. When we produced 30% of all new jobs in the state last year, um, the state desperately needs Wyandotte County to continue to grow. And when the state says you can grow, but you can't provide police and fire services, you can't provide sewer services, you can't provide the basic amenities uh, to support that growth, um, it tells communities don't grow. And so it is as backwards thinking um, a piece of legislation as you, as you can imagine. And passed, I might add, without a single hearing, passed without a single thought, um, very marginal legislation pushed by a very marginal group of people um, in our state um, who have this fallacy that somehow local governments are out spending crazy amounts of money. I wish we just don't have crazy amounts of money to spend. Uh, we have, we're, we're pinching nickels every year and cutting back and being efficient. Um, and this policy is probably as toxic and hurtful a policy as we have um, in terms of what, how we're going to be able to move forward. And it's a, it's a high imperative that we get this repealed. I don't know if anyone else would like to comment about it. Uh, Representative? Are these on? Uh, is this on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mary, for your remarks about that. I absolutely agree. We elect you in Wyandotte County to make those decisions. Those are decisions that should be made here. There are not, there are not decisions that should be made in Topeka. Um, and the process was the most disappointing part because in the waning days of the session, that was literally thrown out on the Senate floor. As the mayor said, there wasn't one hearing. There wasn't an opportunity for any of you to come forward or any other local communities to come forward and point out the problems that this would cause for you. So it was unbelievable that the, uh, the process that occurred to bring this piece of legislation to you. And I have to tell you, I just heard the other day that although there's legislation that's going to be offered that would repeal this, there's also going to be an effort to move it <coughs> forward a year and take away some of the exceptions that we got. The ex exceptions we got put in the legislation. So it's very possible that this bad piece of legislation could get much worse. I, I, don't, I would never support it, and I can't imagine most of my fellow Wyandotte County legislators would support this, but it's bad on so many levels. Well, and I think that's, I think that's the, the issue, is um, just due process in terms of giving people an opportunity to have hearings on it to see what the impact would be. The other hypocrisy of it is, the state um, raised sales tax significantly in that budget. Did they impose a requirement of a state um, election in order to raise that sales tax? I mean, to require something on the local level that hypocritically the state refuses to implement it on itself is inexcusable. I mean, it's a double standard that, that should not be tolerated. Um, and so I think that's just another level of, of hypocrisy in this legislation. And, and I would point out, Mayor, um, that just a little more fact to back this up, and we talked about this a, a few weeks ago, but you know, every 1.5 mils of every property tax bill that citizens pay goes to the state of Kansas. The state of Kansas did not place themselves under this bill. So if assessed value grows in KCK or Bonner Springs or Wichita or Topeka, the state's gonna reap that, that windfall and not, not put themselves under, under this tax lid provision. Um, from 1998 to 2013, the property taxes collected from that 1.5 mils by the state increased 67%. Property taxes collected by the 25 largest cities in Kansas increased 3%. Senator? I just want to say that uh, sadly, uh, Representative Moore and I were at an uh, event earlier this week and listened to the chair of tax in the House and the vice chair of Ways and Means in the Senate both say that they 
don't see anything, any repeal of this tax lid. Uh, and uh, as Representative Moore said, you know, the issue of in, uh, moving up the date is uh, probably a greater, it, are, are probably going to move forward as fast as having the repeal. I mean, I'm not saying that, that, that I don't believe that cities and counties should move forward because um, I've now listened to the county, Johnson County, make this, uh, a similar presentation since I do have a portion of Johnson County. Um, so you're absolutely right. This, you know, I, I sat in the Senate when this was introduced as an amendment uh, and unbeknownst to anyone on either side of the aisle at the time it was introduced. So I, um, I th unfortunately think this piece of bad legislation, unless there's some really, really large move across the state, is not going to go away. Yeah. And, and Senator, I agree. Um, we're pushing for the repeal. We also have um, a plan B, which in case it can't be repealed, is to at least make it workable. Even the proponents of this bill admit that it can't be implemented because of the requirement for a public vote and the way it doesn't mesh with our budget cycles for cities uh, and counties. Those budgets, th we would have to have, if we collected more revenue than we did the previous year, we would be forced to roll back our mill levy or else put it to a public vote. Well, our budgets aren't even certified until August 25th. How do you have an August 1st election? You can't. So that means a November 1st election. Well, the election commissioner needs at least 60 days to get a ballot question prepared, and federal law requires that those ballots be received to overseas military personnel 45 days before an election. So it doesn't take a math whiz to look at the calendar and figure out this bill is totally unworkable. And the reason it's totally unworkable is there was no bill, there were no hearings, it wasn't vetted. It was thrown out as an amendment on the floor at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon after the 100th day of a 90-day session, and by 4 o'clock it was passed by the Senate. So I think the process that was used was horrendous, undemocratic, and, and it's totally unworkable. So even if it does advance, it's got to be fixed somehow because it can't be implemented. If, if, sales, re if sales go up in the state of Kansas and sales tax revenue goes up, um, can the state of Kansas capture that additional s revenue for themselves, or do they need to roll back the sales tax? No, they can collect that. In fact, that's what they're praying for, is that it does go up and they can collect that revenue. So they're, they're hoping that their revenues go up and everyone else's go down. Is that right? All right. Mayor? Yes. So I have a question to follow up on what you mentioned, Senator Petty. Um, you said without some pretty wide response to this uh, legislation that will probably go forward. We're opposing it. Um, I know the Kansas Association of Counties, it's their number one agenda item. So they're opposing it. And the league. So what kind of, what kind of widespread message would you think be effective if the, if the League of Cities opposes it, the Kansas counties yeah, oppose it, little cities like us oppose it. So what kind of message do you think would register? Uh, I think what uh, Mike alluded to was this respectful relationship between state government and local government is, is, <coughs> is necessary. And at this point in time, uh, I made this comment just the other day, you know, I'm just finishing up my first term in the Senate, and I have to say that I've and I was there in the House in the 90s, that vast difference in that relationship and that respect for local government. And, and when you see that the uh, Association of Counties and the, and the Kansas League of Municipalities unanimously oppose and have this as their number one priority, I would agree. I don't know what that effort would be, except that I'm just we're saying to you, here we have two people that are in powerful positions Session has not even started, and they are already, in, in a sense, are reflecting a, a closed-minded approach to a piece of legislation that, as Mike said, was in her, it never had, was never vetted, was not in bill form. Even if it had been in bill form and not had a hearing, 
you le at least would have had um, the opportunity for those that lobby for cities and counties to have had conversations with legislators about it, even if it hadn't had a hearing. But in this case, no bill, no hearing. Um, you, it makes, um, it's kind of like, you know, being on a black night and there's no light there and suddenly there is and you're being blinded by the whole thing. I wish I could tell you what that change would be. I don't, I'm just sharing that I don't see it as a feasible change with the client, with the climate at the legislature we have now. I, I'd like to ask Mr. Bach, what if percentage increase has the health insurance and pension in our, in our personnel gone up? Right, um, in the last couple of years. Can you give us a ballpark on that? Um, it's exceeded the rate of inflation dramatically. Yeah, I want to say it's around 7 to 8 percent. 7 to 8 percent a year? Yeah. So, so what's going to happen, let's be clear, 80 percent of our costs are personnel. Our health insurance goes up 7 to 8 percent again. Pension continues to go up. The cost of doing business goes up. And we can't capture the growth in our own community. We're going to be laying off police officers and firefighters just to keep up and uh, my hope is that this our legislative delegation will step up to the plate and vote to keep our public safety on the ground where they belong and not push people out of their positions based on this um, this arbitrary notion that um, the state without evaluating any local issues um, should take control of this so the risks are real for our community um, I think the risks are real all over our community and um, I, I'm imploring our, our delegation, and I know most of you are there, to continue to fight against this kind of nonsense. Anything else on this issue before we move on to the next? I, as we wrap up on this, I'd point out that we do have a number, and I think there'll be more chambers of commerce that oppose this, because they realize it's not positive for economic development and building quality communities. I mean, nobody wants to pay high property taxes, but on the other hand, are you going to sell homes or bring your business to a community with crumbling streets and high crime where you don't have enough police and fire? So uh, this one, again, it's more of a general statement. Again, it's just asking for a renewed partnership and cooperative spirit with, with the state government. Um, okay, those were the issues of money that we've lost. And as you saw, it's now costing us $8.2 million a year in lost revenue. 18.2. 18.2 million, thank you. That's 18 that, mills. That we used to receive. That would, that would represent 20% um, of our mill rate yeah. in lost revenue. So, and I know many legislators don't like this when I've talked to members of the tax committee and present company included, but I've told some of them that we're pushing the property tax. I said the largest reason for high property taxes in Kansas is the Kansas legislature. That's right. Uh, the abandoned housing issue. This one we've talked about and talked about over years and years, and, and I give uh, Representative Fraunfelter immense credit uh, because he has continued to push and dog this issue despite being rejected year after year. We finally are starting to make some headway with it, and it picked up a lot of support along the way, and I think even uh, people like the Senate president who initially opposed this are now starting to come on board and, and support it uh, as a way to deal with this because once they learn that it's, um, it's in every city in Kansas. So hopefully we can get it passed this year. Uh, the urban opportunity zones, again, another great opportunity to give uh, communities like ours, Wichita, Topeka, others. Uh, what we originally, the governor proposed a pilot program that just affected Wichita, Topeka, and Kansas City, Kansas. When I talked about this in front of the League of Municipalities and got them to put this in to their platform, the mayor of Garden City, Kansas said, well, um, it sounds great, but you know, I've got some blocks in my city that we could use this. So we decided, well, let's not limit it to just these three cities. Let's open it up to, based on criteria, you could designate an area and then put these different tools to use in those areas to try to rec recruit those businesses. City elections, I don't think we need to talk anymore about that, but I will predict within a couple of years, the, the first elections in the fall are 2017, I will predict the turnout won't greatly increase and then the next move will be to make them partisan. Okay, the, the mutual aid bill, we've talked about that. 
the Medicaid expansion. I don't know, Mayor, if you want to address that, but uh, you've got some interesting statistics. About well, Wyandotte when County. Wyandotte County has 5% of the state's population and 10% of the state's uninsured. And through the Affordable Care Act, we were able to enroll, um, take the uninsured in Wyandotte County down from 26% to 18%. So nearly a third of the people who are eligible uh, who had, did not have any health insurance before have it now under the Affordable Care Act. The expansion of Medicaid would cut that number in half again. Um, there are people in our community who are too poor to qualify for the Affordable Care Act, and the refusal to expand Medicaid is a direct attack on our poor seeking medical care. And I'll give you this example. We are number one in the state of Kansas in the diagnosis of stage four cancer. This past January, our police got a 911 call a woman called frantic, an older woman called frantic, delusional, thought she had been shot. The police came. She was bleeding from her chest. They called an ambulance. The ambulance took her to KU Med. KU diagnosed her with stage 4 breast cancer that was bleeding through her shirt. There was no screening for stage 1. There was no doctor's visit for stage 2. There was no treatment for stage 3. The woman's dead. This is a first world country, and we refuse to expand Medicaid for the poor so that basic, God-fearing people can go to a doctor and find out what's wrong. And the refusal by this state to deny our poor, the poor in New York and in California, they get that doctor's visit. The poor in Kansas do not. And plan B by our state legislature is zero. Forget it, we don't care. We don't care that that money is coming in. The state of Kansas accepts $4 billion a year into our state budget from federal aid for transportation, education, all kinds of things, and for uh, health care. The, the additional $500 million expansion of Medicaid would be a drop in the bucket to what the state's already taking from the federal government and would help the poor. And it would help those of us who do have insurance because KU Med and Providence are bleeding money right now from unreimbursed care that's eligible under Medicaid expansion. Um, the state of Kansas choosing um, you know, they take $4 billion in federal money. If we called it Obama culture, would they stop taking the agricultural subsidies? I doubt it. Um, people are, are taking federal money for other things, but they're not taking it to help the poor. And we have too many people in Wyandotte County who desperately need this care. Um, and we uh, desperately need the state of Kansas to step up and do the right thing. Don't need to talk any more about that one. Um, I think our concern now. I, I could preach longer if you wanted me to. <laughs> we should move on. Amen. Thank you. Okay, protecting home rule and local control. Again, this goes back to trying to, to repair the relationship with the legislature and realizing, getting them to realize that we're really at the local level are partners or should be partners in government providing public services. We're not enemies. Uh, the CAPERS issue, that's going to continue to be talked about and changed, but again, uh, we should not strip away benefits for lifetime employees who've been promised those for decades and the year before they're supposed to retire, we suddenly strip those away. Juvenile justice issue we've talked about. So here's the... Here's I, the I would like to say something about yes. the juvenile justice issue, though. Sure. I did serve on the work group um, with the Pew Foundation, actually attended meetings all summer long uh, on the juvenile justice issue. And... Um, Phil, you know, brought up the point of the fact that there isn't a piece of legislation yet. I will say that from the that group perspective, because it was it was well represented by the courts and uh, by court officers and um, the judicial system as and and the legislature, um, that from the committee's perspective, it was very much the fact that. We absolutely agree that it won't work if the funding doesn't stay within the system because you can't, um, you know, all the stats say that going into group homes is not reducing recidivism within the, uh, the within a judicial system, but um, that uh, community-based programs are the better answer. 
But at that being said, we, uh, we, I would say that we absolutely agree, and that was the overriding conversation all along, that the f money has to stay within the system and go back to the communities. Now, as we all know, uh, if that happens or not, but I will tell you from that committee perspective, that was definitely what we all felt uh, within that. And the, you know, the chairs were both chairs of Corrections and Juvenile Justice on both the House and the Senate side. Very good. The other, another key piece to this, um, we have in District 500 alone in Kansas City, Kansas, we have 1,400 homeless children. Um, the fastest path to homelessness for children is aging out of the foster care system or teen parents without support. Um, we need to, um, and if we have another 100 plus kids coming back from group homes without the support of the state that it needs, um, we're going to have more homeless youth, we're going to have more problems. One of the other issues we run into in our court system, not just for adults but also for youth, you have to put them in jail. You can only do house arrest for people who have a house. If you have no address, you cannot be put on house arrest. Um, the only alternative is jail. And so we have an issue um, with making sure that we're addressing the issues of poverty with our children um, and not just a lot of kids who end up in the system are end up there de facto because they're poor. Um, and we need to and we need to make sure that um, it's not a crime to be poor. Um, that you ha we provide the adequate resources for people uh, to find a home in a stable environment where they can be successful. Thank you. I saved uh, perhaps what may be the best, or at least probably the hottest issue uh, of this session for last. Uh, there's a lot of movement surrounding casino gaming and, and the gaming legislation that's on the books. Uh, for a number of years, the unified government had taken the position, our legislative program, that we supported the Woodlands reopening with racing and slots under the current law that was passed back in 2007. Um, there is a bill that passed the Senate last year that would change the financial landscape of the gaming laws and we've had some discussion about that and how it would affect the Woodlands and the Hollywood Casino. So this is proposed language based on conversations. If you remember, we did a special session on gaming legislation a few weeks ago. I'll review a little bit of that just to bring everybody back up to speed. But th the proposed language for the 2016 UG legislative program would say the unified government supports legislative measures uh, which assists the Woodlands in reopening as a gaming facility so long as the Woodlands provides benefits to the local community which are on par with the benefits provided by the Hollywood Casino at Kansas Speedway. It goes on to say, acknowledge that the Hollywood Casino is a significant tourism and economic community partner with Wyandotte County and that we would oppose any changes in state law which put the Hollywood Casino at a competitive disadvantage with Kansas City area casinos and gaming facilities. We, we'll talk in a minute about the financial structures, but one of the first things that comes to my mind on that is smoking bans. We, um, under Kansas law, smoking is allowed in a very tightly defined definition of casino gaming floor. There have been attempts in the past to ban smoking at the casino, and I'm not going to argue the merits or the, the evils of smoking, but the fact is if Kansas, if, if Hollywood Casino can't allow smoking on the gaming floor, it would put that facility at a huge disadvantage to the Missouri side casinos, which do allow it. So that's one of the things that that particular paragraph is, is addressing. As far as the top one, I think there'll be a lot of discussion on that tonight, but I will quickly review uh, so it's fresh in all your minds the way the current law works and what's proposed. So under Senate Bill 66, which was passed in 2007, and you know, we had seven different companies that were bidding to build a casino here in Wyandotte County. The requirements in state law for the casino were a $225 million minimum investment. They had to pay a $25 million privilege fee. They guaranteed to bring a second Sprint Cup race to Kansas Speedway, and that, through independent economic studies, say is worth $100 million for that one weekend to the larger Kansas City Metro. 
they agreed to build a sports car road course in the, in the infield of the Speedway. They agreed to construction of a hotel, and they provide a free Village West shuttle that, that tools around Village West and, and moves people around. So those were all promises that were made and part of uh, that they had to agree to in order to, to be considered and get our endorsement and then the state. Um, so the revenue distribution under the current law, uh, the state gets 22%. The city and county get 3%. 2% goes to the problem gaming fund. The casino agreed through a developer agreement with us to give an additional 1% community contribution. Um, they agreed to pay a 1% penalty if they didn't build the hotel within a certain time frame. That's not happened yet, so they are paying that penalty, which this year totaled $1.4 million. Um, so basically, they keep just a little under 73% of, of for expenses and profit, but they also agreed to pay $500,000 a year to non-host school districts. They uh, provide $500,000 in charitable grants. Um, they're providing $100,000 to our Parks and Rec Department for programs, $25,000 to the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and $10,000 to, to a number of chambers of commerce. So those are the things that were agreed to and that the Hollywood Casino is committed to provide. In 2015, the Hollywood Casino has paid to Wyandotte County government schools and organizations $14.6 million. That's in property taxes, all those contributions that I just talked about. Now, under what's been proposed under Senate Bill 192, which passed Senate last year, the Woodlands could reopen with 2,800 slot machines, uh, horse racing, and simulcast betting, they would have to make no minimum investment. They would not be uh, required to negotiate a developer agreement with, with the unified government, and they would have to add no local added contributions. The distribution uh, under the new bill would be 22% to the state, 10% to the horse fund, 2% uh, to the county only, and I'll note that the Hollywood Casino pays 3%, 1.5% to the city, 1.5% to the county. Under this bill, they would pay 2% to the county side only. 1% uh, for the racing fund, uh, some money, no, nothing to the Greyhound fund, a half a percent to the problem gaming fund, whereas the casino is paying 2% to the gaming fund. And then the owners uh, would be able to keep 64.5% of the profits and expenses in those early years. Um, we opposed Senate Bill 192 last year, and the reason was that it changes the fundamental financial landscape of the gaming law in an effort to get the woodlands and, and other tracks in the state reopened. Uh, but from the investment levels to the number of slot machines allowed, Senate Bill 192 restructures the gaming laws in a way which we felt put the destination casinos at a competitive disadvantage. Um, reopening the gaming laws now also, and this is something I've been wary of for years, we reopen the gaming law, the way things work in Topeka is, the bill may say that this is about reopening the woodlands, any possible amendment that could come up, could come up. And one of the things that's worried me is perhaps a smoking ban amendment, uh, perhaps the state, being a little short on cash themselves, might say, you know, since we've got this thing open, that 3% that goes to the local government, yeah, maybe just 1%, we're going to keep that other 2%. Any and all of it could be reopened for discussion. Um, the Woodlands would not be required to make any kind of minimum investment, negotiate a developer agreement, or make additional contributions. And one of the things that's been discussed is that we need to level the playing field. And the language that we're proposing for you to consider is, let's do that. Let's level the playing field for the local community which means Woodlands and new owners provide us with the same kind of benefits the casino has to. Let's talk about developer agreements, minimum investments, community contributions above and beyond what the state law says. And that's what that first paragraph of our language is suggesting, is let's sit down with the new owner of the Woodlands and discuss those kind of things and see if he's amenable to do that. That would level the playing field for the local community in terms of the benefits that that, that could provide. Um, 
So, and, and as we talked about in the previous session, the reason there's a difference in the tax structure from what the casino pays to the state and what the track hat would have to pay, the tracks were not required to put any kind of minimum investment into it. Uh, no $225 million minimum, no $25, $25 million privilege fee. So, yes, the track would have to pay more to the state, but they, didn't, they weren't required to put up any money up front, basically. So that's the reason that that law was crafted the way it was. Um, and as we talked about, back in 2007, Governor Sabuse came to the Woodlands and they had a huge party uh, when they signed that bill. And the Woodlands was cheering passage of that legislation and said that within six months they would have slot machines at the Woodlands. As you know, the Woodlands has been closed since 2008. So we're faced with a, with a different scenario now in terms of the legislation. And from discussion I've heard from some of your commissioners, that's why this is proposed language um, that would say, yes, we'll support the Woodlands reopening, but there's got to be some conditions that go with that. Um, that would level the playing field as far as the local community is concerned. With that, I'll stop and allow discussion. Commissioner Kane. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Before I get started, you guys in Topeka, those are long days, long nights, and uh, I beat myself in the head watching you guys work because I don't think I have the patience to perform at that level. I'd probably get up and walk out more and stay in. But, and I've been told before I make this statement that if I make this statement, then they're going to campaign against me and get me beat because when Pat was on the commission, the mayor was on the commission, Ann was on the commission, we, we negotiated with the folks out there saying, if you do this, this, and that, in, in return you will get this, this, and that. And when we give our word, our word's supposed to mean something. And my word still means that. You know, uh, they can open it under the current conditions. We've said that all along. And they haven't built the uh, hotel, but they did give us the money they said they would if they didn't. And, and the reason they're not building the hotel is they're, they're worried about what's going to happen with the, uh, the woodlands. i got to remember, I'm the one that lived out there before the woodlands was out there, and we were told it would be the saving grace. And it went under pretty quick. But what the casino has done has sustained and gotten better and better and better. And they've been a really good community group of people. So when I'm looking at this, I give my word way back when that this is the way it would be. And I will not change my word. Commissioner, this uh, Woodlands is in your district, is that right? Correct. Did anyone related to Senate Bill 192 reach out to you or any of the anyone else you know in terms of the the county to talk to you about that the only one I talked to is a representative Burroughs but here's what's funny the people have reached out the one that you're talking about 73 percent where I'm where the, the people have come to me it's more than 73 percent and say leave it alone now the ones that are for it they're very loud and even louder than, than the group that I'm talking about but no, I was not reached out to, and, it, and it's frustrating because I've been it by that building for the fair. It's terrible on the inside. So there'd have to be some sort of capital improvement. And nobody's saying they can't do it. You just have to follow along with the rules. And like you said, like what Mike said, and Mike does a great job up there. He's got a lot more patience than I do. But when you reopen something, what are you reopening? How far does it go? How far does it dig in? And then what do we, we've already been told you can't do this from Topeka, not necessarily the folks in this room. We've already been told you can't do that. We don't have home rule. They've taken prevailing wage away from us. You know, so there's multiple things that are happening to us that has specifically hurt Wyandotte County. And, and when the people are coming to me saying, Kane, this is what I want you to do, I'm real good about doing it. But we have to look at the big picture, not the small picture. And, in, and the guy that purchased the property was one of the guys that encouraged everybody. He had his lobbyists go up there and say, we want this language written there now. Well, now that he purchased something else, well, I'm changing my mind because now I got this and I, I want it to go that way. So when we, we look at things, we have to look at what's best for the community, not just what's best for a few people. 
you know, and, and as, as, we, as we, we, we turn it around and everybody's going, well, I wish we did this or I wish we did that. Well, we made a great big wish. We were handed it to us. And there's an opportunity for another one as long as they follow the guidelines that were originally put in there. So does anyone else want to weigh in on this? I mean, I think part of the discussion for how, what stance we take as a unified government hinges on this. It has, it has been previously, we support no changes to the gaming legislation. We do not support the reopening of it, of the legislation, not the woodlands. Right. Um, that the, the legislation in place already allows the woodlands to open. And we support that legislation um, and not uh, the new piece that has come forward. Um, the question is, one of our experiences, and I think some of our legislatures have the same experience, is sometimes things happen to us that we're not very excited about. And so we're, the commission's decision that we need to talk about tonight is, do we want to modify our statement from no way do we want to see it opened under any circumstances, or if this moves forward, it needs to follow these guidelines? The risk is, if we can't stop it entirely, um, do we just get hit with whatever? I mean, the bill that was written is a, is a, it cuts in half the local support. So we still pay all the police and fire support. We still pay the, all the infrastructure support, um, all the roads, all the sewers. We pay all the expenses for the, um, and if you ask our chief of police if opening another gaming institution is going to increase calls for service, he would tell you yes. Um, but the amount and all of our police departments paid out of the city side. There's not a nickel for the city in Senate Bill 192. There's not a nickel for the city, but we're going to be providing all that police coverage. So I want to uh, make sure that we, um, the decision we need to make is, do we say, leave it alone, we're not doing anything, and risk it happening and us not having our voice at the table? Or do we say the statement that Mike has made we don't want anything detrimental to Hollywood Casino. They've been a great partner in our community. Um, and it needs to be a level playing field in terms of the local support should something change. That's kind of where we're at. Uh, Commissioner Walker. I've been curious, and, and we've not, a, at least I don't know of anyone that has addressed it, of, of whether the current bill in it, is this really a question about whether a horse track owner makes any money or is it about whether he makes money but just not enough money? Um, I think it was noted that they were quite pleased with the original legislation and it was only sometime after that that we began hearing that they couldn't make any money doing it this way. And, you know, to me, money, it's, it's really, that's really what this is all, all about. We have a wasting asset, a piece of property that we cannot get control of. We can't condemn it for a public purpose because the state has blocked us, protecting the rights of the individual to own his property. We have to have an act of the legislature, can I, which I can imagine would be a hoot trying to get that through Topeka. And so we've got this asset out there that is, is, is wasting. Now, surely, if, surely the legislation could provide, I don't know exactly how to phrase it, you know, everybody wants a piece of this action, and I'm, I'm for protecting the existing casino. But there must be a percentage of what, I'm just saying, what if the tracks had to pay a percentage, perhaps decreasing over years, perhaps increasing depending on the gross, to the Hollywood Casino as a compensation for uh, whatever they gave up. It's kind of the money washes it all. I mean, I, I, I don't know that there is a number that Hollywood or Penn, Penn National would step up and say, well, yeah, if we got 5% a year of their gross revenues, uh, we'd be fine. We'd be happy. 
we will compete with them. And uh, just a thought, but we're we're in a we're in a conundrum about this property because we're not ever going to be able to get a hold of it, and it's a prime piece of real estate that could be developed into a lot of different potential things. And but essentially, I'm not for changing the bill unless there is a meeting of the minds with the existing casino operators in this state as to how they might be compensated or share in a revenue that would uh, take away the pain of, of whatever the betrayal or the broken promise or whatever you want to call it. If that not, that not occurring, leave the bill exactly like it is and do nothing. Commissioner Markley? I think what I hear Commissioner Walker saying is I hear the attorney and him coming out and the contract negotiator, and I think the difficult part of this for us is that really this legislation is a development agreement of sorts, and it's going to get negotiated in Topeka without us at the table, um, and that's it's, it's frustrating to know that that's going to happen to our community one way or another. It's not the kind of development agreement that's coming out of our office that our administrator is involved in. It's going to happen as a piece of legislation. and. Um, so this today is our opportunity to, to discuss with you all what we'd like to see, but the difficulty is, as you all know, as these things get negotiated, there are all these little nitty-gritty details that we may not be able to be involved in, and so what we have to send you with is a vague statement that says sort of what we hope might happen up there. So I guess I'm really just expressing my fr frustration in that sense that, I, you know, I think that what Hal and I see as attorneys is, well, yeah, we could reach a deal here somehow, but we're not going to be there when the deal is happening. We need you all to go in with the spirit of what we're hoping for, and that's that's the best we can do is send you forward with sort of an idea and hope that whatever nitty-gritty details happen might come out okay. So I see what the mayor is saying. There's a danger in saying, as Commissioner Kane said, we don't want to change anything because that takes us further away from having any seat at the table then if something moves forward, we've given you nothing to work with. We're hoping in a vague statement we can give you something to work with, but the bottom line is if, if language starts moving forward, all those details are going to be out of our hands. Representative Burroughs? I think that was very well stated. Uh, I think what's missing in this dialogue is the question, has the local unit of government met with the property owner to determine what kind of project can go in addition to uh, the development of the facility. I know there's needs and wants for economic prosperity and opportunity in this community, and as legislators, we're, we're quite proud of the fact that we've seen a development such as uh, Western Wyandotte County, known as the Legends, and the partners that we've created through the uh, NASCAR Motor Speedway, Kansas Motor Speedway, and Hollywood Casino. However, we do have a large chunk of ground that has been bought by an investor and uh, just a little bit of the political aspect, the bill, Senate Bill 194, has been moved to calendar and printing, which is basically a nail in the coffin for a bill, unless there's a procedural move on the floor to advance it out and move it forward. So that bill is, is I don't want to say it's dead, but it's very difficult to say that that bill will be moving forward. I anticipate another bill coming forward. I'm hearing discussion of another bill coming forward, and I would it strongly encourage as much as I possibly can to be as attentive on both sides as we possibly can. This delegation wants the best for our community. We have fought hard. We have a tremendous amount invested in the development out in Western Wyandotte County. And I have clearly stated as, as the Democratic leader that the revenue sharing aspect and the ownership <coughs> that, uh, that our local government and our local community has in any development is first and foremost in my mind and my priorities. That we have local leaders that uh, should be at the table and they should be engaged in any decisions moving forward when it comes to any kind of development, let alone one that uh, deals with uh, casino gambling. I will state there are a number of projects that would fit on that piece of property. I know I have taken it upon myself to reach out and try to get as much information as I possibly can so that I can come back and share it with my local leaders, my delegation, and my caucus members, because I truly believe this will be an issue that will be moving forward. In what language? Commissioner, you stated it very well. I would like to see us have some say should this thing advance and advance in an in a, a expedited manner. Uh, I stand ready to do our part uh, in what's necessary to ensure we protect the interests of our community. 
but I think we're being very short-sighted if we don't engage in some kind of conversation with the previous owner or the prior owner uh, as well as the present owner and determine what's best for the property. Commissioner Philbrook. Well, thank you for that uh, lead-in. So I'm going to get down into the weeds and say, I want to know what kind of monies we're talking that the present or the owner that is looking, the new owner, is looking to make and what shortfall they're feeling there is that they need to have this change in the, in the um, law. I mean, straight down, until I know what kind of things they really need, not what they say they need because that's what they want, but what will really work and what kind of, oh, what kind of deal we can make, you know? Let's make a deal. I think everybody can come out of this. I don't see why everybody has to stick their heels in the sand, in the sand and get drugged back and forth with all this stuff unless everybody likes the politics of it. I personally don't like the politics of it. I'd rather we work together and came out with an answer. So I would like to see them come and talk to the city seriously about they want what they want to see us do, how we can help, but on the other hand, without slitting the throats of our present partners. I, I'd like to say this is one of the challenges of absentee landlords. We've had a number of development opportunities on these 400 acres that we have taken to the Grace family. I've personally spoken to the Grace family. I've sp personally sat down in the same room with the Grace family, pitching development opportunities for them to sell their land at top dollar. Um, they've refused to do that, and they said, quote, you know, we don't need the money. The $20 million for the property, we don't need it, so we're willing to sit on it, well, you know. Um, the dilemma of an absentee landlord of not being willing to let us move forward, we could have had a couple of different development offers. Greg Kendall could tell you the amount of work he's done to put that in play, and we had opportunities. One of my concerns, and I think this is real, dog racing in America, I mean, I think we just need to look at the numbers. I don't think dog racing in America is coming back. Um, dog racing is on its last leg, if you will. Um, I don't know where I don't know where dog racing goes from here. Um, and if you look at the numbers, the other thing is horse racing. I mean, horse racing makes the news twice a year. Um, and if you look at the sports that are growing in America. Soccer, we made a major investment in soccer. Um, NASCAR, we made a major investment in NASCAR. Uh, we've been willing to be very proactive and very thoughtful in growing enterprises um, in the community. I, I don't know what the future of horse racing is. Um, I know it benefits some um, very wealthy breeders in our state. Um, I don't know in terms of the growth um, of how fast horse racing is growing, um, if at all. And I'd be interested in looking at the demographic of people who are going to horse races. Um, one of the things that Sporting Kansas City touts is they have the youngest demographic of any major sport, younger than baseball, younger than football, younger than hockey, younger than NBA. Um, and I think if you look at the, if you looked at all of those sports and then added horse racing, I would be interested to see where demographically that falls in our country as to who's going to horse races. Because I asked all my friends, if you're going out of town to travel and you want to do something fun with your family, well, you can't go with your family, so forget that. If you're going with your spouse or friend, is horse racing something you're looking to do with your travel dollar? It's never occurred to me, but maybe it's occurred to other people. So I just want to make sure that we don't end up with a smoke-filled slot machine, slot parlor, that's not a world-class destination. Our Hollywood casino is a world-class casino destination. It's a full service casino. It had a minimum investment that it made. It has a first class look and feel to it. Um, there is no reason that anything else that's built in our city would be to a lower standard than that. Um, and the reason it's at that high standard is because of the development agreement they signed with our unified government. Um, without a development agreement, and they can just come in and this can be foisted upon our community, without a development agreement from the local community, um, and then one day the horse racing goes away, and then, which may be where it's headed, and then we just have slot machines there. That's not a benefit to our community. 
and the casino that it will hit the hardest of the ones in the metro area is the Hollywood Casino. It's the closest, and it's the one that's going to take. It's the it's going to the one's going to take the biggest hit. So if Kansas, the, one of the worst things that could happen to this city and to the state of Kansas, is for Hollywood Casino not to be viable. Um, we lose Hollywood Casino, and we lose a lot of money, and the state of Kansas loses a lot of money. And people ought to be as concerned about that as they are about reopening the woodlands. So I think that's the balance we're trying to strike. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it's a, it's a puzzle. It's a real puzzle um, in terms of how we handle this. But I would like to ask uh, Senator Fitzgerald, I believe you authored one ninety Senate Bill 192. Would you like to talk to us a little bit about what your hopes are? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate that. Appreciate all of the comments. Um, Mike, you obviously have some serious concerns about what could happen if there's a new bill that comes in. And it seemed to me when you were saying that, that your concerns were more about what could happen than what's actually in the bill. Am I correct in that? No, I, I think you're accurate in that. I'm concerned about what type of amendments could surface sure. or as a new bill is being structured. and, and particularly on the, the percentages that are now in the current bill that affect the local government. So if you wanted to take the least risk alternative, it would be to pass this bill and avoid all possible changes to it that bring out all the fears that I don't think are unfounded at all. I think you, you're a very seasoned uh, person in the legislature. You understand the risks that are involved there, as do, as do many, if not all of us. So I don't think passing the bill as it stands by the House, the leader, uh, Burroughs, has accurately portrayed it as being, well, not quite in the morgue, but very close. But it's, there's dead, and then there's almost dead. So it's, <laughs> in this case, it's almost dead. Um, and yet, I don't think it's necessarily the worst thing that could happen is to revive it and pass it. That might not be the worst thing that could happen. So I just want to put that there. The, um, the, the quick history, we've had a little bit of history here, and I'm not deep into the history here, but I do know a little bit about it. Uh, I don't believe that the Woodlands was ever considered to be a substandard uh, eyesore while it was operating. It was actually uh, well thought of. It was a bragging point. It was uh, a lot of economic development, a lot of jobs. It had the largest restaurant in the state of Kansas. Um, everybody liked it. And uh, families did go there in the sunshine, outside watching horse racing, Sport of Kings. The, uh, I don't want to say anything bad about Hollywood Casino, and please, I wouldn't want any of my remarks to be construed that way, but it's a very nice, large box, smoke-filled gambling casino. Um, and, people, and we don't want to do away with the smoking, as Mike pointed out, for the reasons, competitive reasons. What happened to the woodlands? The first thing that happened to the woodlands was Missouri allowed the boats. And among others, Argosy Casino set up shop. And you got into some of the problems that you're discussing now. And it became a tough, became a, a, a tougher industry, a little bit harder to do. The, uh, the push for gaming, expanded gaming, uh, was largely to put slots into the woodlands. That's what people had in mind. They were trying to put slots into the woodlands to save the woodlands. Now, I wasn't at the table, and I understand it was a few people at the table standing around when they finally got this thing, Senate Bill 66, iced down. 
And I don't know who had what celebrations and who was weeping, but the net result of the thing was it killed the woodlands. It went out of business because of Senate Bill 66. Now, it was teetering because of the problem that I mentioned, but it had hoped to move up, and instead it, it died. That death was not a good thing for Wyandotte County. It was not a good thing for Kansas. Um, why, didn't, why didn't the Woodlands have to put up all this good faith money and these privilege fees and so, and so forth, which was used to ensure that the investors coming in were in fact going to do what they were going to do, said they were going to do, because they put up earnest money. They put up good faith money, that they would in fact make those investments. The Woodlands had already made those investments, and far beyond those investments. Millions and millions of dollars were already there. It was standing. It was working. They didn't need to write a check and put it in escrow in order to have good faith that they were going to do it. They'd already done it. They had already paid enormous amounts of taxes over the years. They were already a contributing factor to the economy. They didn't need to promise that they would do stuff. Now, the casino did promise, and they have lived up to them. And like I said, I don't want any of my comments to reflect badly on the casino. They're doing a good job, as, as mentioned. But I think that, that the Woodlands has been painted inappropriately as being a drag on the economy and a potential blight on stuff and, and so forth and so on. And I don't think their side of it has been fully appreciated. Would you be willing to um, work with us in terms of making sure there's a development agreement and making sure that there is um, uh, adequate local funding that the casino is making now in any bill that you support? I mean, would you be willing to work with the local community? In or because it's in Wyandotte County, and I think folks in Wyandotte County should have some say as to what that bill looks like um, rather than not. And so would you be willing to work with us in terms of the items that have been lifted up? Um, the, uh, first off, if, you had, if it hadn't gotten killed in the first place, you would never have had any of those things. But you would have had, and would still have, an economically uh, contributing uh, entity out there that would be making, that would be providing a lot of those benefits already. So um, that's just background comment on my part. I'm, I'm open to talking to anybody. I called the Hollywood Casino when I first got to Topeka to talk about the possibility of doing some of these things. The governor's office has called and talked to Penn Gaming. Uh, we weren't able to get anywhere with any of that. Um, I wouldn't put anything aside. You know, my motto is never say never, because things can always get better or worse. You have to make a decision as to whether you want to avoid the risk and possibly get this bill out and, and done, or whether you want to shoot for more on a new bill, which may not get through the Senate this time, might not get through the, I mean, we could wind up with dragging this on the same way as it has been the last seven years. So, yeah, I'm willing to talk, I'm willing to listen, I'm willing to entertain, I, I welcome that, but uh, I just want to make sure we all understand that what we're all looking for is better economic development in the area. Well, and I would suggest that we, I think we would agree that the Senate Bill 192 as written, we absolutely don't support. And well, so it would be better for us for that to be killed. If there's a better bill, we'd like to be a part of articulating what that says. Commissioner Markley? What I was just going to say, as far as the economic development side, if there's one thing that I think we do well as a government, it's development agreements. And with everyone, we improve and we learn lessons and we're good at those agreements. And I think what we've learned, and I haven't been here as long as some of you, but what I think we've learned in all these lessons is that the way to not be disappointed or not have a bad development is to be involved in the front end and to have an agreement where the two parties put out front, this is what we expect out of each other. And our, our success, I think, is evident in our Village West developments and our developments in the urban core. All of our developments that have these agreements have been successful. And I think it's because we spent that time on the front end with both parties saying, listen, the way for us not to be disappointed with each other 
is to sit down and talk about what we want this development to look like before it starts. So I, th I think we all agree that we'd love to see the woodlands be an economic factor in our county again. What I think we, we want to see is that discussion on the front end saying, okay, what is it that we actually want to see so that we're not on the back end going, this isn't what we wanted at all. This is bad for our community. It's not what we wanted to have happen. So it's not that we're saying, no, Woodlands, we don't want them at all. They're going to be terrible. It's that we're saying, we want to have that discussion to make sure we know what we're getting and that it is going to be a contributing factor to our economy. And I understand that, and I appreciate your comments and the earlier comments that you made, Commissioner. Uh, I would like to just clear up, because you seem to have an assumption in there, at least as a listener, I, I heard an assumption. An assumption that I'm relaying from my constituency. Well, but I just want to say that. Now you can clear that. Well, the assumption that I, I, I thought I heard was that the bill was written to accommodate the, uh, the buyer of the, uh, of the woodlands. Uh, I will tell you that that bill was written and that buyer was not in mind, no buyer was in mind, and there were several other buyers, potential buyers, that I had thought were, were probably going to come forward. So it was, the, it, was, it was the bill that caused the buyer to come forward and, and not the other way around. I, I just wish we had been included in the discussion for the drafting of that bill. Uh, commit, uh, Senator Haley? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to weigh briefly in. Can I, you please speak directly into the microphone? Thank you. I uh, appreciate this discussion. I've been in continue to be uh, a supporter of the opening, uh, a reopening of the woodlands. And, you know, uh, when you look at what has happened historically with it, um, I, I know that Senator Fitzgerald can speak to it. Um, uh, previous Commissioner Kultula, who then became a senator, did not weigh in as strongly for the redevelopment of the woodlands as many of us felt that she could have or should have. And I think that that was to the benefit of now Senator Fitzgerald. I'm looking at the additional information that you've provided this evening from uh, Cole Hargrave uh, and the new uh, polling as to where people stand. I think we've all been provided that. And I just want to say that when Commissioner Philbrook speaks of her constituency, I want to be uh, unequivocally clear uh, that my constituents want to see something happen with the woodlands. Maybe it's a branding issue. They would like to see it open. They have said, and as they gradually learn more and more of what the, the state legislature does or can do, that whatever it takes, and second to that, I should share with the commission, uh, there's some concern about the underutilization of other spaces in my, in my district, like Indian Spring. And uh, as asbestos removal was coming and as the uh, ATA center uh, was put in place, there's still that desire to see that which we have had that has been beneficial. And, and the names that have been attached, be it Woodlands, Indian Spring, that we make better use of prime property and prime ground. Uh, now, if there's a rebranding effort, uh, maybe the Woodlands isn't called the Woodlands anymore, Perhaps um, some of my advocacy for seeing it reopen would, would change, but um, it is um, it's a very strong issue among many of us, many constituencies, not just in the area where uh, former Senator Kultula is, but certainly um, in the Northeast area uh, where I am as well. Um, okay, Commissioner Murguia and then Representative Reese. So I just want to say that um, I understand when people are passionate about issues and feeling left out or feeling like they've been done wrong, that they, um, I don't know if angry is the right word, but frustrated or disappointed by that. And some of the things we've talked about, including this particular issue that involves the state tonight, um, I agree I'm mutually disappointed. But I don't think what is helpful is to um, come across as attacking or belittling to our state legislature. It just seems very old school politics to me. The reality is this, the state of Kansas, the voters in the state of Kansas have elected who they've elected. And those people that they've elected are in their mind trying to do the very best that they can do for the state of Kansas. I believe that. And we local people may not like that, 
Um, but I think the focus should be on figuring out how to get something instead of nothing. And so I go back to what Commissioner Markley and Commissioner Philbrook, you alluded to this, that I want the state to know this development matters to me and how it comes out matters to me. And I stand ready, me personally, I stand ready to work with the state any way possible to come up with a win-win agreement. I wanna see Hollywood Casino continue to be very successful. I'm a customer and I have a great time when I go there and I love it. I also wanna see new development come to our community and be prosperous and do well also. I wanna see all of those great things for Wyandotte County. The reality though is that the state elected officials get to decide. So I don't wanna be part of discussions that are belittling decisions that are made. I don't that think that puts us in a good position to negotiate. I think we have a very highly respected county administrator at the state level from both political parties. Um, I think if we were to do as Markley suggests and come up with a development agreement based on what the proposal is right now that we could live with, that we think would benefit our county, and we all got on the same page with that and promoted it in a positive way at the state level, I believe that would get us a lot further than talking about how terrible the state is to us. I just don't think that, I think that's very counterproductive. Representative Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's sad that uh, the, the anticipation of, of discussion is that the state is bad to local governments. Facts are facts. We can have opinions on why these things happen, but facts are facts. You can see about the, the gaming, the gun control, the education, health care, all these. Um, as far as as the Woodlands, I enjoyed the Woodlands when it first opened up. Uh, when my daughter turned 18, we went out there and let her place a few bets. I did not know that Senate Bill 192 was exclusive of, of not including the unified government since it was in Wyandotte County. It's the first I've heard about it. And I knew that uh, Senator Fitzgerald was the uh, author of the bill. I didn't know what parameters he was established and what partners he brought in. I know we have industry people here this, the, tonight listening to this debate or to the discussion. And I would suggest, and I know the delegation mostly reflects, uh, we want growth from Wyandotte County because what is good for Wyandotte County is good for the citizens, is good for all of us. Uh, right now, from being from Wyandotte County, a native Wyandotte County, and as we go have been in Topeka, being labeled as a substandard or a subculture of the state, and even as recently, we had a dark cloud over us because we were Wyandotte County. So they were praying for us down at the state level. That's what, to me, we were, it was kind of funny. We prayed for them as well. So I would just kind of like to recommend, and maybe even be part of the discussion, and, and major, Minority Leader uh, Burroughs, I'm sure, would, would go along with this, that is this, if Senate Bill 192 happens to uh, face a demise in the legislature and another bill surfaces, that parties be involved to discuss the, low, you know, the UG, the delegation, and whomever wants to be involved in this, so we can see it, whatever is good in industry, we include industry partners. Open communication is always good. That's right. That way nobody gets offended, nobody feels left out, and all partners who are stakeholders, as you, as you, we all reflect the constituencies of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, Edwardsville, and Bonner Springs, that we feel good about what's happening instead of uh, being a result of what's happening. And that's my two cents, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Senator Petty. Um, I'm just going to go back to your original question and about the fact of uh, if there was discussion about a, a different bill, what would be uh, the input that you wouldn't want to hear from us is what should be in the bill. And I'm kind of, I've been on both sides. I was here as a commissioner when we actually, when Senate Bill 66 passed and was part to be make decisions with the development agreement and then now I'm in this in this Kansas Senate um, but I was in the house when that when gaming was moving along and we know that it's took from probably about 1990 to uh, when gaming first became a or maybe not maybe it's as maybe it was about 92 it, 
somewhere in that range, to when uh, legislation was finally passed. Um, so that didn't happen quickly, but I, it seems to me that there are a couple of things. One, the comment was made about um, about more about economic development. We have economic development going on, so we're not talking about um, cr about uh, what we are talking about an impact, but this would be an addition to not lessening what's already happened because of the Hollywood Casino. So I think that if one of the two aspects, there should be in any bill that we're moving forward, there should be a development agreement that has to be brought forward and includes the local units of government. That's happened with Senate Bill 66. That's why the unified government was able to be at the table to make some decisions before it ever moved on to the state. Um, this has no piece in it for that to happen. Um, so if, in fact, there was going to be discussion about a new bill, that certainly should have to be a piece of it. And it should include all the pieces that were there before as far as um, percentages and what, what kind of investment, because we're really not talking about um, we're talking about a something that's going to have to be totally rebuilt. So we might as well be saying that we're talking about a new piece, a new, a totally new business, because anyone who looks at the Woodland now knows that it's not going to just open their doors, because it's going to be just what you said. It's going to be shoddy. It's not going to be uh, worthwhile. It's not going to be contributing, and it is just going to be a slot parlor. Parlor. That's all it's going to be. But. I don't know that that's what the owner or the maker of this bill wants to see happening, but what was the goal initially in 1998 when uh, we first started acquiring property and the uh, Speedway came, or we started negotiations with the Speedway, was that it would be uh, outstanding and be quality and that we would that the unified government would would have the ability to move forward and that you wouldn't have shoddy development and you have been successful with that and that should be the that's the model that you want to continue seeing happen so there should be a development agreement and there should be a discussion about job growth impact because we have jobs now at the Hollywood Casino any change would have should have a positive job growth, not a negative job growth. So it seems to me that those are two pieces that are very important to look at with any future legislation that we're definitely missing in this legislation. So let me see if I can summarize. Um, I've heard from a lot of commissioners, I think, and from Mike Taylor, I think what I'm hearing and is that we want to work with Senator uh, Fitzgerald, we'd like to work with you. We'd like to work with the owner. Um, we'd like to work with the industry representatives. And we'd like to sit down at the table and talk about what a bill might look like that we could be excited about and supportive. Um, does that accurately represent commissioners where we're at, or am I misstating that? Um, and I think we also would say, in lieu of being able to sit down and be a partner at the table, we would. We were a partner on Senate Bill 66. We'd be supportive of that staying in place. We were not a partner in SB 192. We'd just assume that not go forward. We might be a partner in a new bill, um, but we'd like to be at the table to help negotiate that and make it something that'd be great for all of Wyandotte County. Does that sound accurate, Commissioner Walker? Maybe I missed or didn't hear it, but I think Microphone, please. A partner in that discussion meets I hope you're implying needs to be Penn National. And yes, that's a stakeholder in the community, yes. And uh, and it might be that the answer they give us is uh, no, hell no, under any circumstances, but I think uh, they need to be part of the dialogue as to what options could exist. Again, I go back to the idea that perhaps there is some compensatory uh, contribution that would soothe their uh, 
idea of breach of contract. Maybe not. I mean, you know, I don't I don't deal with big money. A hundred dollars is a lot of money to me. So maybe there is nothing, but I think they have to be at the table as part of the discussion. All right. Yes, Commissioner Commissioner Philbrook. Uh, I want to apologize, Senator Fitzgerald, if you thought that I was thinking that it was that particular bill was written for them. I'm sorry if you thought that because I did not mean to imply that. What I mean to say very directly is I want them to play well together and I want us all come to the table. That's all. That's it. All right. Any further discussion on the casino gaming? Senator, any further? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mike, anything else? I will. Well, in, in conclusion, I will say, and, and this is the caveat I always give, and, and I know you commissioners understand this, and I think the legislative del delegation does as well, for the citizens who might be watching. This legislative program, this is proposed language put together based on my recommendations from what I've heard from all of you. It is your legislative program, and I will go to Topeka and carry out whatever the directives are in this. This is my guidebook during the session. I mean, if you said we want a platform in there that go convince people that the sky is green and grass is blue, I would go over and do my best to sell that argument. So this, this is your program. So any language that, that you want in there, and if this reflects what you've said, if not, we've got a week to tweak it. Uh, my intention is to bring it back to the commission agenda for the December 17th meeting uh, for formal adoption. And that way we can publicize it and our citizens and everyone else will know sort of these are going to be our positions and our platform for the 2016 session. So, so I'm going to make this request um, of all of our commissioners and all of the um, representatives and senators who are here. I'm going to ask everyone to review this for the next week. Make any notations. Um, those of you in Topeka, you may read something and say, boy, if you worded it this way, that would be a big help to get it moving forward. You know, you have that insight. So we would count on your insight in terms of um, working with us in the language. Um, if there's an issue that's not on the agenda um, that we're missing, to raise that up, um, that would be a big help. Um, and commissioners, we'd like you to review it as well. And if there are changes or additions or subtractions, we will uh, be voting on adopting it December 17th, and then it will move forward as the platform. Now, we can make a change in decision January, February, March while the session is in place. As issues move, Mike brings us legislative updates all the time, and if there's a, a new issue coming up that we need to take a stance on, we can certainly do that and give Mike direction. So it's not the last bite at the apple, but certainly we want to wrap this up uh, next week. So we appreciate those of you in Topeka to review it and to give us your feedback on it. Um, and we appreciate, I just can't reiterate enough, uh, my appreciation to our state delegation uh, for all that you do for us um, and it's not just during the session. You have a lot of meetings, particularly when you're in leadership. Um, you have a lot of meetings um, uh, throughout the year. So we just appreciate your working with our community and the work that you do. We have the same constituents, and we appreciate the opportunity to work together. Yes, uh, Representative. Mayor, I'd like to make a couple of quick announcements. Number one, our delegation yearly form is going to be January the 5th at 6.30 at the West Branch Wyandotte Library. So we invite all of you to attend that. And the second announcement is about a Medicaid expansion. There was a very successful form, legislative panel and form, um, in Wichita a few months ago, and they're replicating that here in Kansas City. It is January the 5th, also during the day, and I think the time is either 11 or 11.30 it begins, but I can get you that. So it'll, there'll be a legislative panel. There'll also be a business panel. And once again, this is going to be sponsored by the hospital association, the hospitals, many of the foundations in the area, many of the chambers. So the support is really growing for this issue. So if you or anyone you know would like to come to that event, that would be fabulous to show support. It's 11 to 2. Thank you. And I would ask um, Representative Burroughs, as the minority leader, would you like to make any closing comments? I want to compliment the local leaders on reaching out to your delegation. I think it's extremely important as we try to move our community forward and make the advancements that we all anticipate we can make collectively, that we continue to have this dialogue. And some of it may be tough, but we all have the same end game, and that's to make our community a better place, not only to 
live and play, but also work. And uh, we stand ready to do our part. And I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to hear your concerns this evening and whatever we can do to partner moving forward. And my last comment would be Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you as well. We are going to take, it takes about 15 minutes to reset our technology downstairs. So we'll start at about five after um, in the commission chambers downstairs. Delegation, you are welcome to stay for our meeting if you have not, if you've not seen one in a while. But um, it's a Thank you for watching. Please visit our website at www.wycokck.org for a complete listing of our schedule for public meetings.